surprisingly enough, the Detroit Tigers, now one of the hottest tickets in town. Who would have thought that? Let's bring in Lynn Henning. He's a freelance baseball writer and contributor to the Detroit News. Lynn, great to have you on the show. Good to join uh, all of you good folks this morning. So, uh, Lynn, I, I will say the joke around here is uh, I'm married to a sports guy, but I know nothing about sports. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not disqualifying, believe me. <laughs> you know, my biggest concern is the schedule and when he can get days off so that we can take a vacation because it's like, oh, no, the Lions are playing here or the, you know, basketball here or college here. So that is really my biggest thing. But if uh, I want to, we brought uh, Larry Nyland into the the studio so that he could talk to you a little bit about baseball. But before we get there, Lynn, can I ask you, uh, just what is your take on uh, the Detroit Tigers so far this season, especially in the middle of COVID? Are the fans returning? Yes, uh, they are. And uh, that's good to see. It's probably uh, primarily tied to the fact that uh, the ball team's a little bit better to see now. And uh, that wasn't the case for a while, but a rebuilding team, it takes a long time in baseball. It really does. And I knew this one was going to be super long because of all of the variables that uh, they were dealing with in terms of contracts and aged players and things that had gotten rolled up during the last years of, of Mike Illich's tenure. And uh, so this one was going to be a, a marathon. And yet, uh, I figured this year things would begin to brighten for them. And really, that's been the case. Uh, what happens in a rebuild is that you do get some surprises along the way. And they've gotten a few this year with uh, Akil Badu and Eric Haas and uh, Derek Hill and some people like that. Uh, and suddenly now, they're, they're pretty interesting because uh, also they have the young pitching that people like to come out and see, whether it's Casey Mize or Tarek Skubal or Matt Manning. And uh, that's, again, part of um, a, a team's revival and a team's reconstruction is that you begin to uh, get things going that fans suddenly are finding themselves interested in and attracted to. So, Lynn, uh, we're a couple weeks out from the uh, Major League Baseball draft, and I know you were covering that extensively for months. Uh, I was following you on Twitter the night of the draft when Marcelo Mayer fell to the Tigers at six. You were convinced that he was coming there, and I was convinced that he was coming there, and the Tigers instead chose Jackson Job, the high school pitcher. So what was your thinking on why you thought the Tigers were going to take that and then why they ended up taking Job instead? I think going into the uh – big team meetings, the powwows, the top secret stuff the week before the draft, I think uh, Meyer still was probably number one to them. Uh, but Job, uh, the more that they began to analyze the video and talk with the scouts during um, those few hours before the draft and those, those days just before the draft, I think the consensus changed. And I knew that they liked Job a great deal. Uh, if Meyer was gone, then it was going to be Job. Uh, I didn't think that they would show, uh, choose Job over Meyer, and yet they did, which tells you everything about how convinced and, and how convicted they are that uh, Job is really going to be uh, an extraordinary pitcher, and he should be. If his health holds up, which is always a big if with pitchers, uh, he, he really should be uh, something quite superior. So th that's the way it goes. Uh, Meyer was so good that the next team after Detroit, Boston, scooped him right up. So uh, again, there was that anticipation. But they think Job has a chance to be a better pitcher than they thought Meyer had to be a shortstop, which means you're talking not only all-star talent, but really long-term all-star talent. And um, in Job, uh, it, it's hard to argue with that right now based on what he is showing them. Yeah. And with uh, even if had they had drafted Meyer, I mean, that's still a shortstop four years down the road. But the Tigers right. still have that gaping hole at shortstop. How do you think that that is going to be addressed here coming up? That's the question everybody asks, because uh, I, I don't think you're going to see them go spend three hundred million dollars on uh, Carlos Correa. Um, and, and I really wouldn't advise them to do that. When you get into a contract that long and that expensive, you're taking uh, an awful lot of risk. You're also boxing yourself in from being able to spend on other areas that you really need to. And I think that's what cost the Tigers a chance at a World Series back in 13, is they were so overcommitted 
on salaries to so many other players, they didn't really have enough money to go out and do the bullpen repairs that they really should have been doing. And so that's where it gets you. And uh, so shortstop, uh, either they're going to be able to make a trade at some point, and I think had Spencer Turnbull not been injured, they could have dealt him for a very, very good shortstop prospect. Or they have to hope that one of their internal people comes up, whether it's uh, Ryan Kreidler or um, someone like that. There, there's a possibility they can get some help there. But otherwise, it's going to be left either to a trade uh, or to some free agency that uh, is within their budget and, and get some, a player that uh, can develop. But shortstop right now, I agree, uh, Larry, that, that's their big, big, big issue. Uh, I was watching uh, some double A eerie baseball online the other day. Uh, Spencer Torgelson, Riley Green. If you had to guess what their timetable is on how close they are to being actually playing in Comerica Park, what would you say? Yeah, I wrote about that this morning, in fact. Um, uh, I think you can expect Riley Green uh, as early as out of camp next year, but probably more likely Old May or somewhere along those lines. Uh, Torkelson should be right behind him. And so let's say we're talking a year from now. Then I think we're talking about Green and Torkelson both being in the starting lineup. Uh, Dylan Dingler, there's not as much need to really rush him because uh, Jake Rogers and Eric Haas uh, clearly are taking care of the catching responsibilities right now in pretty, pretty good shape. And so they don't have to hurry him up. But Ding Dingler's going to be pretty darn good. And then uh, it becomes a matter of how quickly some of these pitchers they took even this year uh, uh, could be ready. And that might get to a Ty uh, Madden situation. He, he's the college kid out of the University of Texas, and he might be ready to go even next season. So I think the fan base is going to like this infusion of fresh blood because it's going to be talented blood, and it will be arriving in pretty steady fashion here fairly quickly. What are your thoughts on Matt Manning? Uh, he struggled a lot in AAA this year, and they s decided to bring him up anyway. He's had flashes, looked good, yeah. you know, given up a lot of home runs. But what 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 is his uh, high end? They knew they were bringing him up a little early, but they wanted uh, Chris Fetter, the pitching coach, who was really, really, really good, uh, to work with him. And they thought that uh, that might be the better environment for him. Now, he's going to have his bumps, and we've seen a few. But the big thing with him, uh, Larry, they're going to need to get him a fourth pitch. That slider that uh, they've been working on with him is really important. If they can get the slider to come around, uh, you're going to see Manning uh, about where Mize is right now. And uh, that means uh, he, he's going to have uh, the potential to really be a, a thoroughbred in a blue chip pitcher for them. So I'd keep my eye on that. Um, I think Scooble will also, of course, polish and refine what are pretty remarkable skills that, that he brings. And then next year, I think a lot of people are forgetting they're going to be getting a couple of Tommy John pitchers back. And that's uh, Joey Wentz, the left-hander, who's got a chance to be good. And um, so does Alex Fiato, uh, one of their first round picks from 17. And uh, he'll be, I think, in a position to give them about what Tyler Alexander does now. So that is how you get a rotation stronger and deeper and better. Uh, you made a reference to uh, Kiel Badu earlier. Um, when you look at, I mean, it's a very rare thing for mm -hmm. a player, a, a a Rule 5 player, to come in and have that kind mm -hmm. of success. Um, but would he? be having that kind of success if he was just put, uh, called up to his double uh, uh, A team with the Minnesota Twins or is the fact that he's working with the with AJ Hange with these the top end coaches on the Tigers I mean would that make you think that hey maybe some guys are babied a little too much and not brought up quicker than maybe they could handle no I think it's a combination of two things first of all you have to have the skills that Badu has and and they are really really uh pretty extraordinary for particularly a rule of five player but two things helped there he had tommy john surgery two years ago which we know is unusual for an outfielder and then you had the pandemic so that enabled him in back-to-back -back seasons to sort of slip through the cracks but the tigers had scouted him very well 
and that was a shrewd pickup. But um, he, he certainly would have been doing well at the minor league level this year and, and maybe putting him in position to be uh, a later call-up. But uh, the Hinch and, and his staff, the ability to work with him and not overexpose him and nurture him and really bring him along uh, in, in expert fashion is part of the reason that he's having the success he is. And uh, it's still going to be fragile. Uh, he, he, he might get tired, which is. Yeah, it looks like Lynn may have frozen up there. We'll wait for that to kick back in. This happens uh, just about every day at least once. So he should be back here in just uh, a second. <laughs> you still with us, Lynn? He's really good. Yeah. Um, so um, can you quantify the effect on this year's Tiger team that A.J. Hinch has had? As much as any manager could influence the team, uh, A.J. Hinch has left his imprint on the Tigers. You don't see that very often. Uh, usually, and I've always been of this persuasion, uh, a manager is as good as the players that he has around him. Uh, Hinch is even better than that. And um, he, he's very happy with this job, by the way. He, he, he liked what he saw coming in. He still likes what he sees. And he particularly likes what he thinks is coming over the horizon. But the Tigers stole him. And there's no doubt he would have been managing the Chicago White Sox if it hadn't been for Tony La Russa and the owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, uh, having such a mutual affection uh, the tigers got a break and uh, sometimes you're entitled to get some breaks along a rebuild road and um, i think they were due not only hinch but bad doing a couple of other breaks here they've gotten this year uh so if you listen to any sports talk radio in the area uh whenever the tigers come up and there's complaining it's always al avila is he too maligned is the criticism justified in some ways, or what are your thoughts on Al Avila right now? Well, I understand the criticism, and uh, there, uh, a GM's always vulnerable uh, on, on any particular front. But the thing that I really believe people needed to be fair about here, and this has n nothing to do with Avila or, or any defense, but I knew this rebuild was going to be a very long process, and that's because Mike Illich and his waning years had taken on so many contracts and so many old players and it was going to take a long time to get rid of that to where the rebuild could actually begin and for that reason i put the rebuild pretty much uh, getting underway a couple of years ago and this is about where i thought any gm would have this team they were going to go through a gruesome few seasons and then you were going to see things begin to arc upward well, I, that's exactly what you're seeing this year. And again, when you add Torkelson and Green to the mix next year, and when you add uh, Joey Wentz and, and Alex Fajardo, um, when you have uh, other pitchers like Job and, and Madden and others that uh, are now in the hopper, what you're going to see is a team that can steadily get better. They will go into free agency where it makes sense, uh, Chris Illich is not going to spend away his dad did, but he's also not a skinflint. And so they will get into free agency. But uh, Avila, I understand again uh, why he's public enemy number one, but in all fairness, any other GM right now, everyone would have been saying they should be better. And uh, this was going to be a gruesomely long process. So I'm not surprised by any of it. I think he, he's done an, uh, an okay job. I'm not sure I, I'd bet that other people would have done a lot better. Um, and um, I think right now they're in a position really to, to build a pretty good ball club here. After the trade deadline uh, last Friday, both Al and A.J. Hinch said, this is the last year that we want to not do anything. We want to be buyers at next year's yeah. trade deadline. Do you think that's yeah. a realistic possibility? I. Uh, Yes and no. I, I think there's as much chance they could still sell next year as there would be that they could buy. Uh, they might do both. And um, in, in that sense, uh, I'd prepare for more deals, though, for sure, because uh, the market is going to get more favorable because their talent is becoming more favorable and attractive to other teams. And, and that'll change the whole nature of trade deadline for the Tigers. 
just want to quickly get you. You've been a lifelong Detroiter there, Lynn. Uh, it seems like the teams are looking up everywhere. The Pistons just drafted the number one overall pick in Cade Cunningham. What are your thoughts on the overall Detroit sports scene right now? Yeah, I got that question a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what team was going to get better the, the, the most quickly? And I said uh, Pistons number one. Uh, believe it or not, Lions number two. And I thought the Tigers and Red Wings were tied for third and that they were all moving north. And I believe that completely. It's easier to build in the NBA and even in the NFL than it is in hockey or in baseball. The latter two really take a lot of time to formulate rosters. But uh, you can uh, turn things around. Obviously, there are fewer players in the NBA and on, and on their squads. And the NFL is always set up to turn over rapidly. And last year's winners can be this year's uh, losers and vice versa very, very easily. The Lions now have a good front office, I'm convinced. Uh, and I really am convinced of that. And I think uh, they're on their way. Uh, I think you're going to see vestiges of that this year. And uh, that, that they're finally on here, uh, a proper NFL path. They've got some foundation. And they've got uh, the ability now to put themselves into a competitive, potentially quickly, a playoff situation. I, I like where the NFL is headed finally in Detroit. All right, Lynn. Well, we want to thank you for all your time today. It was uh, great catching up with you. And yeah. Ronnie, who is our next guest right now? Uh, next up is something I do know quite a bit about wine here in the state of Michigan. Len, great having you. Thank you, as always, for your insight. It's been a pleasure, and we look forward to meeting you in person one day. Enjoyed it, folks. Thanks for the conversation.